Welcome on inside another edition of the Business of Social Podcast, powered by Esteem Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley. It is episode 49. Got a big one for you. If you're watching on YouTube, we got uh, Zoe, my new uh, French bulldog in the house. Zoe, say hello. Zoe, sit. Good girl. Um, all right. So every single show, we um, keep you up to date on the ever-changing digital and social landscape. This week is no different. We got David Feldman, the Vice President of Social Media Marketing at the NFL. This guy oversees a very, very large team and oversees all of the NFL-owned and operated channels, including the NFL and Fantasy and NFL Network. And don't forget about the Checkdown, which just crossed over 1 million followers. Um, they just crossed over 1.7 million followers on TikTok, which all happened uh, just this season. They, they launched in week one, which is pretty impressive stuff. Again, start TikTok. If you don't have a TikTok channel, go start it. Will, 49, what do we got? Yeah, this is kind of a look-ahead episode in terms of uh, numbers to 50. 49, pretty slim pickings. Um, I think we're going to have to go with Bobby Mitchell or Tony Richardson, a uh, legendary fullback. Can you give me some more uh, more context on Bobby Mitchell? and? Uh, yeah, Tony Richardson is considered one of the best fullbacks uh, of all time. Okay. He blocked for, uh, I believe, nine 1,000-yard rushers. For what team? Uh, for the Chiefs. And I believe he's no, most known. Well, for this is like Priest Holmes, Chief. So this is okay. Yeah, yeah. Priest I know, Holmes, I know Tony I know Johnson, know okay. AP, and uh, Thomas Jones. So Tony Richardson is his name. Tony Richardson. Yep. All right. This is just for Dave Feldman since he's an NFL guy. The Tony Richardson podcast. Very random. Uh, but you know what? We'll take it. Not a lot of 49s out there in the sports world. All right. So this will be a good one. Again, we'll talk about all the things NFL. Um, Zoe will not be here for the interview, just here for the intro. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move forward. The vice president of social media marketing at the NFL, uh, my good bud, David Feldman. He is the vice president of social media marketing at the NFL. David Feldman joins us on the program. David, thanks so much for the time, man. Uh, thanks for having me, man. Uh, it's a pleasure. I've been, uh, hoping to get on for some time. So yeah, I appreciate, it. I appreciate it. Um, I always start things off with a random question. So Lamar Jackson on Madden got 97, I think, on speed, which is one above Michael Vick, which is the cheat code of all video games. It was almost unfair back in the day. But now Lamar Jackson, even faster than Vick. Do you agree or disagree with Madden's assessment here? Um, I'm not one to question Madden. I honestly, <laughs> not to be a, a stickler, I think it might be 96 instead of 97. Nice, okay. I, I know, right. I'm going to get called out on it. if I. If but I it's it, it's I, one I, above Vick, though, right? That's all yeah, I know. definitely one above Vick. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean... Lamar is everything right now. Like let let's he's gonna have he almost has more rushing yards than Vic uh, had yeah. in, in the season already. He's still got what five games left to go? Nope, not as many. What is this week thirteen almost? Yeah, so yeah. four games left to go. Yep. Um, he's yeah, he fully deserves it. And the Ravens are rolling, man. It's just it's like they look good. so exciting, such a fun so- storyline for. What's us. funny is I think back in the day there was um it was kind of can you win with a running quarterback and for the Ravens. Um, they actually built an offense around his skill set, which seems like if, if they would have built this same offense around Vic, we probably would have saw the same type of uh, numbers. Totally, you know? they went all in, and it's making all the difference. And, and I even uh, like the fact that I, I even like the fact that RG three, like if something were to happen, you have someone that has a similar style. You don't have to, you know, go to a, a statue quarterback or anything. So I love it. All right, let's get into your story. Um, you know, you spent about seven years at the. MLB before moving to the NFL about five years ago and yeah. much like a lot of people on this program you know having that social background you've really like promoted very quickly throughout your career and now you know vice president which um, you know kudos to you and congrats on all the success can you give the listeners a quick 10,000 foot view of your role and what you oversee day to day over at the NFL yeah so I oversee um, what we call the social lab and uh, the social lab is more or less anything NFL and some of our other properties that be like NFL Network, the Checkdown, um, NFL Throwback, and a few other entities. So anything you see on any of those channels comes from my team. Um, and additionally, we have a, a bunch of content creators. So you know, video editors, animators, illustrators, graphic designers, and so forth. Super, super talented people yep. um, who also create content for league channels and also partner with some of our players um, across the board to create content for some player channels as well. So, so uh, we got a pretty robust team and uh, that all comes from the lab. What's the number of that team currently? Oh man, a lot. <laughs> I don't know if I want to fully, I feel it's like embarrassing. It, we have a lot, we have a, we have a very, um, we're very fortunate of some of the resources and the focus the league has shown towards, towards social. And uh, it's, uh, it's been really nice to see because uh, it took, uh, not all 
big brands uh, have have given such uh, focus this way. Yeah. It's been really nice to see like how it's funny. How you're you're really embarrassed nice. about all the resources you have. But usually, the answer is they're embarrassed about the lack of resources they have. So, I mean, that's that's a, a no, good problem to have. It's right? a, to, to my boss Ian Trevat and our CMO Tim yeah. Ellis, who just joined us, you know, about a year ago, and uh, they made it a point to they saw they know where all the industry trends are going and how important it is to engage with youth and to not just repurpose like old traditional TV content, but to create social first content. Like they. They see it, they they understand it, and uh, they've made my life a lot easier. So so that's really kudos to above. Well, we're talking uh, a little after here Thanksgiving, and I saw a really interesting stat this morning. And uh, you know this probably better than anybody, but NFL and CBS Thanksgiving Day game, Buffalo versus Dallas, 32.5 million viewers on Linear. That's the most watched Thanksgiving it's- Day in 27 years. And we're talking about the transition from linear and OTT and everybody our age is cutting the cord, which is you no know, legitimate, but you still have that monster massive number here as we head into 2020. But your team has focused on digital. I guess the reason I bring all this up is how have you guys balanced it? Because the NFL as an entity obviously has been very heavy on the linear rights of the league, but you yeah. have to play that game on digital. And it seems like you guys are finding a good way to balance both both sides yeah you know it's a great question um we have a really smart like way smarter team than any than than me for sure uh business development team out of new york who handles all of our media rights and they've been really strategic in forming uh purposeful relationships with some of our platform partners with Mm -hmm. uh facebook and uh twitter and and uh and now tiktok even amazon yeah yeah no for sure and so um yeah i've worked hand in hand with them and helping carve like you know what i think might make the most sense for what what our presence should be on platform Mm -hmm. and uh, we've kind of let them do do the rest as far as uh making sure that we're complementing the the linear aspect of it accordingly but uh it's really just uh been incredible to see that you know we've seen some industry trends where uh the linear is obviously the numbers have been going down uh and so to to have such historic numbers Mm -hmm. going right now is just like it just says a lot to the health of the game and the health of the league and the health of the brand, which has been awesome to see. It never hurts when you got America's team on uh, on that primetime window, too. <laughs> yeah. um, you uh, you know, you and I have had a lot of conversations, and one thing I thought was really interesting you once said, and I'd love for you to expand on it, is at the NFL level, you guys, you say you're not competing for the NBA's attention or the MLB's attention. You're competing for all attention. So I'll set you up and let you yeah. explain what you mean by that. No, I mean, it's nothing profound. I mean, I think yeah. a lot of people at this day and age are saying it. It's just like, it's not, we're competing for anything that's on someone's phone. So it's just like, whatever that might be. It might, it might be, um, you know, Fortnite. It might be yeah. some stream that they're following on uh, Twitch. It might be like whatever's going on. Just like some video game that there's some Madden game that they're playing on their phone. So anything we can do to, uh, to, to, to disrupt that and to make the NFL prominent there like that's a big win and that's what we're focusing on like it, it, we're not competing against other leagues or brands we're competing against everything so yeah, uh, that. that's just the reality of anyone in my shoes like that that's what we're, we're, we're going after so that being said i mean because I, I think well while i think it's interesting because i think a lot of people automatically look at their competitors nike looks at adidas nba looks at the nfl type deal but when you start looking at it macro like that i think it has to change the strategy internally so i guess what are some of the talking points that you're using internally to make sure you guys do stay uh, you know, ahead of innovation, cutting edge, and kind of capture that attention? Yeah, you know, uh, I guess there's a few things. One is just like access as a whole. Like we've really doubled down on our LCC program, which is our live content correspondent program, where uh, depending on the, the market, we have uh, upwards of three, if not four content creators in every single market. Uh, so whether it, we're in Pittsburgh, you know, we'll have three uh, LCCs there to work with the Steelers, and they're they're an extension of the the Steelers arm to be uh, at the arrivals when Juju Smith Schuster is at the tunnel wearing whatever cool outfit he's wearing, and they'll be there on the sidelines and warm ups. Uh, so when, the, the NFL is setting up those freelancers for success to be on game day to get you guys more yeah, access. Yeah, exactly. So, so if you check that like our Instagram stories or our Snapchat stories right. or you know a multitude of end of platforms that will push that content, out, if you're seeing some really up close personal type content that's clearly not a highlight hmm. um that's likely coming from an lcc and that's been a really big win for us and like you're sourcing been- those folks that live in pittsburgh so that way you're not flying everybody as well yeah exactly Got so it. they're in market it's also been great for you know if there's a really great community event that we need exposure for or we think that like you know that the club wants to um to have coverage like we can easily get coverage there we can be super nimble 
Um, and it's uh, relatively cost efficient wow. since you know we're in every market. So so travel um, is trying to keep at a minimum. That's super smart. So for instance, like I, you know, Cam Newton's known for his big like turkey giveaway every Thanksgiving. That would be yeah. something where you can hit up your LCCs in Carolina and say, "Do you mind? Can you?" Can we have you guys show up at these type of events? Yeah, something like that. I right. mean, I, I don't think I don't know if it was an LC that actually covered that specific event, it. but it, that's a great example. That'd be a template for exactly the kind of stuff that we do. Like we're in the midst of our hundred season, so NFL one hundred's been a big priority for us. Yeah, and uh, each club has had multiple huddles. We call it where there's some philanthropic community event that each club has hosted. Like so, we've made sure we had LCCs cover all those for the club stories, for our stories, and so forth. Um, I want to get to this kind of a random question, but there's been a lot of talk uh, around the office about because, you know, we work with the Packers and the the digital yard lines that were superimposed on the snow field <laughs> this weekend. There's a lot of talk on Twitter. People yeah. want the game to keep it uh, legitimate. People, you know, I think it's good to kind of know where they are and distance and down and all that stuff. But like, what are your I guess, what are your thoughts? Did you see some of that chatter and were you surprised by it? Uh, yeah, you broke out a little bit, so I'm, I, mean, I think I got the gist of your question, which is more, what are my thoughts on the, the superimposing of the hey, Well, that, just the, the chatter and some of the people that were so angry that it's not it's not old football. It's not like I want it. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a reality where, like, there's going to be way more complaints on Twitter. There are going to be like, yes. wow, love, the, love, love what you guys did there. Yeah. Um, I thought it was helpful personally. Like, I, I like to know when I'm monitoring a game, like, what the down and distance mm -hmm. is, where they are, what's going on here. Um, so I didn't take much issue on it, but, uh, it was, I never seen anything like it before. I, I, you know, we always see, we see like the yellow first down markers, yeah. but I've never seen anything in that much granular detail. It's before. pretty so impressive it was, technology. It was, um, well, yeah, you have, sure. a, you have a, you're a Detroit guy. You have an Isaiah Thomas. Those of you watching on YouTube, Isaiah Thomas Jersey, uh, framed, yeah. uh, up there in your office. You know, I, I go back and look at classics. The NBA on NBC is like, every time I hear that theme song, it's like nostalgic for me. But um, when I go back and, and watch some of those old highlights, they wouldn't even show the score. Like every seven minutes, they would blink and they would go away and you'd have to like keep track. I remember as a kid, you keep track in your mind what the score is. And like, it's just so funny how that technology has sure. just continued. I'm a long way. Um, I want to talk about TikTok because it's been a big, um, you know, thing around here at STN, you know, talking to a lot of our clients about it. You guys, you know, jumped with both feet now at 1.7 million followers on TikTok. Yeah. Um, when, when did you guys decide that was important to dedicate resources to and how, how have you seen success thus far? Uh, yeah, so we knew going into the season that, you know, after looking at some industry, tr industry trends and, and consumption as a whole, that TikTok was going to be a really important platform for us. So again, like Blake Stuchin, who had, who, who's my counterpart on the business development side, did a great job of putting together a deal to, to give us, um, pretty much an unfettered presence on TikTok. Like we put highlights on there. We really try to have a really um, rich personality on there. And um, AJ Curry on my team uh, and Matt Cummings, my team, do an amazing job doing the day to day on there, where uh, really like they're speaking a different language. Like when they're trying to tell me like some of the trends that we're capitalizing <laughs> and why it's fun, I'm like, all right, I trust you guys go run with it. But you'll see our personality on TikTok is super different than our personality elsewhere. It's and closer to the check to, down than probably the own and operate at NFL account. Yeah, you know? yeah, there's definitely some overlap yeah. as far as like the vibe of uh, those two things. Um, but I will say like this also just kind of goes towards just like our focus as a whole as a company and like a marketing team as a whole of like we are really focused on engaging and attracting the 12 to 24 year old demo. Like that is a core core, if not the most important demo for us from a social and digital mm -hmm. side. And we know that, you know, the younger we make and engage with, uh, we make someone a football fan, that they're going to be a football fan for life. And so Smart. it's really important for us as a, as a league and as a marketing team to to be where where, where those uh, eyes are. And TikTok's been awesome. You know, we, we've, we've accumulated a pretty nice audience in just, you know, we only launched week one. So for over 13 weeks, you know, to almost have 2 million followers and... Uh, you know, hundreds of million of video views and one point something billion seconds of maybe more. I don't even know anymore, but uh, a lot of consumption. It's been a lot of fun. I think it's just been really eye opening for the whole for, for us as a team to kind of just see um, to, to play around in there and just kind of create content in a very different way. Um, I think when it comes to new platforms, I want to see if you agree with me. You know, what I've said is when it comes to new platforms like TikTok, a lot of people get, I think, scared or hesitant because they don't have this really go to market strategy and this beautiful red carpet they can lay out and officially launch. And that's probably happening with some NFL teams right now at the team level. Yeah. Um, did you guys have like a very strategic look at it or it's like, Hey, we got to start playing around the sandbox a little bit, figure out what our team wants and, and kind of go from there. 
Yes. So again, AJ and Matt have done an amazing job. And before we launched, I want to say two or three weeks before the season started. So during the preseason, yep. we set up a private account and just kind of really toyed around in there, created Smart. a bunch of TikToks at you know a period of time and got feedback from TikTok directly um, of just, you know, what are we doing well? What are we not doing well? Which we, you know, what should we be testing around with and so forth. So that was really helpful in shaping our strategy moving forward. But I think even with all that aside, like nothing's going to be better than actually just like doing it. Amen. And yeah. it's, I think like once you know you want to be on that platform or whatever platform might be, like your your audience is going to be different than other brands' audience and what, what, what works for you might not work for someone else. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important for you to just kind of go head first or feet first just or start. Both, whatever, whatever. Yeah. just get in there and uh, see what's working and, and try to post a healthy amount of content to, to start testing uh, what, what your brand resonates with and what it doesn't and kind of take it from there. It's very smart. Um, so you mentioned 12 to 24 core demo. I think that speaks to you know Snapchat in a big way. We just had Anmol on the show and he oh, mentioned cool. 90% of 13 to 24 year olds are, are touched by <laughs> in some way, shape or form by Snapchat on a monthly basis, just incredible, crazy numbers. So I'm assuming Snapchat is a big part of your guys' strategy if you are in fact trying to go after that, that young demo. Yeah, Snap's a huge part of our strategy. We've had an amazing partnership with Snapchat for, I wanna say since I've been, so four or five years now. Yeah. Um, so we, we were pretty early on the Snapchat game and we have a really rich presence there where we have unique content there on a daily basis. And the numbers that we're seeing on Snapchat are like real. Like, like uh, as you mentioned, uh, 13 to 24 is like mm -hmm. an important demo for us. And just like TikTok is a, is a huge target for us to, to, to engage that audience, like Snapchat is as well. And that, that's been the case for some time. And I know they've had their own ups and downs, but throughout that entire process, like that audience has been young and it's been the best, one of the best ways and not the best way to engage, to definitely know you're engaging that audience. Yeah. And so we're seeing literally hundreds of thousands of views on a daily basis, uniques from like just even 13 to 18 year olds. Like mm. they, they'll break it down to a really uh, micro level. And it's been a really positive partnership for us to, to engage that audience as a whole. Yeah, it's the, the exact stat is Snapchat reaches 90% of all 13 to 24 year olds in the United States, which when he told me that Crazy. stat, I'm like, geez. Uh, yeah, so that would be very important for you guys is that young demo. Um, I interviewed uh, your guy, Josh Tucker. This is uh, probably a year ago or so now. We really got into the check down at that point. I mean, since then, yeah. um, I know you guys cr crossed the $1 million threshold. You mentioned that. Uh, Josh was the one that kind of convinced you, like, we need to have this separate platform. So um, yeah. how has that platform worked so well for you? I, I use that example all the time in meetings of what you guys did there. But talk to the audience a little bit through why you guys went that route and what, how it's been successful. Yeah, you know, the checkdown has been a really yeah. interesting case study for us. And it's becoming a really essential brand for us as a whole, as a league. But like, we know that there is a lot of football stories that are topical and have human interest elements to it and show players showcasing their personalities and uh, with helmets off mm -hmm. and whatever else it might be. And so we really, you know, Josh did a really good job of building the case of like why it's important for us to have a brand that just focuses on that, like a a football culture helmets off approach to showcase players' personalities, because there might not always be real estate for a, for that type of content on the flagship channels, or a flagship channel, or it might be a little off brand for the NFL to be posting yeah. something like that, especially when it's competing against like Lamar Jackson highlights or you know the bread and butter mm -hmm. of what fans come to see. And so, fast forward now, you know, two and a half years or so, we've really kind of put a lot more structure of like the the strategy behind the checkdown. Um, we really made it so it's just a real focus on, on like some of the core elements of like fashion, gaming. We've done a lot of great stuff with Madden lately on the check down. Uh, we made a real focus like when, when players are showcasing the new outfits, whether when they're um, going on airplanes to, to travel for the road game or arriving at stadium arrivals, like that's become a core element of, of what fans are looking for. And the check down is a really nice job of serving that type of content. So, and also like for so much of our partners um, on the influencer side, where just like the check down is a perfect home to be showcasing some of that content of uh, some of the influencers in the stands at stadiums and so forth. So um, we've seen some really nice progress in a short amount of time there. And it's become a brand that, that you know, fans don't, not all, not all fans even know that, it's that the league's involved exactly, with it. Which I love. And yeah. that's a testament to the content there. Like, mm. like the, that, that's, that's just showing that, you know, that, that, that content can stand on its own and doesn't need the, the shield in front of it in order to succeed. Yeah. And I mentioned this a lot, quite a bit on the podcast, but, 
you know, Turner, Turner Sports has Bleacher Report, NFL has to check down, um, you know, and, and having these sub brands because it just always doesn't make sense to have all the content on the mothership at NFL. And, you know, I think you would agree when the at NFL says something, people can look at it almost as a Roger Goodell statement. <laughs> I mean, you have to be careful on that PR okay. thing. So it sounds like um, that's been good for you. I mean, are you surprised? I am. I want to get your thoughts. Are you surprised more leagues, more brands don't experience more with kind of those sub channels and, and shoulder programming? Um I don't know if I'm surprised. I mean, some leagues have it. Like, so, so uh, when I was at MLB, uh, it was at the same time we launched Cut Four, which is pretty similar vibe as what the checkdown is for the NFL. I know a PGA um, has Scratch, for instance. Yeah, yeah, and like, I mean, the, the NBA seems to be doing a pretty good job, regardless. So, right, like, uh, right. who am I to, to to say anything along those lines? But you know, it's. I will say though, also, like, it's a slippery slope. Like, we're like, you know fans expect brands like the checkdown or cut four or whatever it might be mm -hmm. to have to be a bit edgier and to maybe focus on some stories that the league as a whole would not want to draw attention to. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's been a work in progress to make sure that, you know, we can serve authentic content there while also staying true to the the values and the the core um, goals and understanding and the responsibility that it is to to work at the NFL or to be affiliated with the NFL. Right. So um that's been that's been a challenge like, no, i wouldn't say a challenge but like that's just been a reality of stuff that we have to do in, in judge where it's like uh we don't want to there's certain stories that like better off the check down doesn't cover and that's okay and uh that's been something you know some good learnings that we've had moving forward yeah from an nfl perspective i mean how do you handle because like i said when you the biggest microphone for the nfl is your digital press presence and a, and a tweet or an instagram post regardless of the situation um I guess for you as VP, but the buck probably stops with you when it comes to stuff going out on social. So how have you, I've always been curious on how you arm your team with that ability to, you know, raise a red flag if there's that, maybe the AB situation or some of those other situations this year that are kind of on that edge. Like how do we approach this from an at NFL standpoint? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I mean, look, with when you have, when you, when you're overseeing a brand like ours, uh, there's a ton of responsibility that comes with it. And I'm very fortunate that I have a really strong team that has really strong editorial judgment. Yeah, it's important. That said, there's like an incredible amount of nuance mm -hmm. and ambiguity that comes in certain stories or certain phrasing of headlines or whatever it might be, or captions that we need to be very close to and uh, be made aware of. And so like I'd say as a whole, um, I definitely empower, I have a lot of trust in my team and uh, I'm very fortunate in that regard that that um, that I can do just that. But I can't overstate how many times uh, on a day-to-day -day basis I get flagged for, hey, do you think this is okay? Or do you mind taking a look at this? Or whatever it might be. Just in case, yeah. And that's essential. Like, I mean, that, that, that should be the case at any news desk or any publisher, whoever yeah. it might be. Like, you can't be afraid to raise your hand. Uh, I certainly like do what I can to create an environment where people feel completely free to ask questions mm -hmm. and to flag anything that might be over the top. Um, uh, probably too like, um, sorry, like I, how am I trying to say like that, that they might be overly cautious right. and that's okay. I'd rather be overly cautious and ask what someone might consider being a dumb question mm -hmm. versus, you know, someone just going on their own and making an editorial decision that that was a mistake. Right. And so, I really put a lot of trust in my team and uh, you know, I do what I can to make sure that they like they whether they slack me uh, I'll be in the room or whatever it might be like, you know, that they can ask me whatever question they might have coming now. From and have you employed any type of uh, peer to peer review or any type of QA like I guess um, hierarchy? Um, because I, I guess I always get fascinated about the amount of content going out of that building <laughs> on a daily basis. And it's really easy uh -huh. to misspell Lamar Jackson accidentally, super innocently. Sure. And that can cause an issue or what have you. So um, any granular like steps that you've kind of implemented in place to help out with some of those those innocent errors? Yeah, I mean, look, there's there's some sort of hierarchy of responsibility that that is for for whether it's like the check down or for the NFL or whatever, for certain accounts and so forth, like there is a manager or okay. someone for the day-to-day -day overseer of, of those respective properties. Um, <coughs> as you mentioned, like we literally do almost a thousand pieces of content per week Jeez. across our handles, Crazy. sometimes more. And so like 
there's going to be, you have to have a level of autonomy in order to mm -hmm. meet those numbers. And I, I will say like, by all means, like we, I think we do for the most part. And like, there's been some hiccups as, as there will be at some time to time, yeah. like there's going to be typos. There's going to be probably wrong editorial decisions sometimes, mm -hmm. but I will say like, I do like, and this is something that we, we talk about on a daily basis, honestly, of like, feel free to raise, always raise your hand, always ask, always flag it. If you don't know, ask your manager. If your manager doesn't know, that person should ask his manager yeah. or her manager and so forth. And like, I don't know, like, I can't tell you, I don't think there's a day that goes by where I'm not texting my boss being like, Hey, like, what do you, what think? Do you think about this? Yeah. And I think you just have to have those types of conversations when in this day and age, when like the wrong phrasing mm -hmm. can make something go viral for all the wrong reasons. Yep. And when you have this type of megaphone that, that we have, and we're fortunate to have it for the most part, but there's downside to it as well. Yeah. And like, that's the reality of where we are. So you, uh, again, Detroit, you know, you have Barry Sanders be behind you as well. I want to, uh, you know, shout out your <laughs> office. Um, from a team, oh, there's 32 teams. I know you have, um, you talk with all the, the different, you know, marketing and social departments at those teams. How do you spread the love? Because I'm sure there's times where, you know, at your level, you're playing the hits. You know, people love themselves some Lamar Jackson. They love Tom Brady, et cetera. Maybe your Detroit Lions are like, why don't you ever talk about us at all? Um, is that ever an issue or do you guys just employ like, hey, we're going to we're going to give the people what they want. We're going to play the top 40, if that makes sense. No, it makes sense. A good question. I mean, like we do we do like it's a it's a couple things, right? I mean, like one is. We're tasked with from the from the league level of posting content that we think are going to engage with as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. So for for the most part, right? Obviously, there's like sponsored content or platform partnerships that we have that we have to hit. But that aside, like my goal is to engage our fans, like at the, the highest level. And so there's going to be certain storylines that resonate more than others. And there's going to be during depending on the ebb and flow of the season, certain clubs that might be resonating more with our fans than others. And that's just the reality of where we are. I will say like we do what we can to to make sure that when we're creating bigger pieces like whether it's a uh, like our Thanksgiving illustration or something like that where like we make sure that all 32 clubs are course, represented. Yeah. We've also created and this is a testament to 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 um, our our club marketing team where which led by Rich Elmore and Sana Merchant where you know if clubs want to make sure their message gets out that there's an open line of communication where they can request amplification mm -hmm. or even for that NFL to post certain things. And we're, we're always happy to accommodate. Got it. So I'd be lying if I said that we, we probably feature most like, every club, the, the same amount, but I think we do what we can to make sure that all 32 clubs have a pretty vibrant presence on our channels. Um, I mean, this is obviously kind of a loaded question. Cause I was going to ask you how much fantasy football has helped the game. And obviously that's an easy answer, but I mean, I mean, in terms of, even the you know the Bengals beat the Jets, somewhat of a non-story. Both teams are not doing very well at all. However, I would assume some of that content, simply from a fantasy perspective, whether it be um, you know Le'Veon Bell or Andy Dalton or what have you, like if you played them as a streamer or you started them, that content may get more engagement than it would have you know ten years ago when fantasy wasn't as prevalent. Have you seen that as well? Like some of these teams that. In, in the past may have not made headlines like it's important to post because people care about those numbers yeah i mean like i wouldn't say that we post highlights specifically because they have fantasy relevance mm -hmm. um i think our fantasy handles do a nice job of doing yeah, something like that right um but i do think as a whole because of fantasy fans are familiar with far more players than they would normally be mm -hmm. so like when tyler boyd has two back-to-back -back acrobatic catches last week like it's not even a quite like it's we're fortunate where yeah, we'd be posting that regardless of who did that. Yeah. But now we actually know that like we feel comfortable that our fans are going to have awareness of Tyler Boyd and his his immense talent, despite him playing in a smaller market. Right. And so right. uh, I think fantasy has been a huge win for the league as a whole. And there's certain aspects of fantasy that have helped make um, just our players as a whole more relevant across the industry. Um, you know, obviously, there's been a lot of changes over the last few years in the NFL, like you mentioned, is really um, kind of double down on, on where everything's going. But as we sit here going into 2020, I'd love to hear from you, like from a, from a league standpoint of what you're going to be able to see in the next, you know, th two to three years down the road, what are some things that you're paying attention to that you really think are going to shift things, um, when it comes to digital social and just consumption overall? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't like, I know our TV deals are up, I believe next year in mm -hmm. 2020 and I, I, I 
that far for me to comment on something like that. I don't, it's not my job. But right. that'll be interesting. Be hard though. To think that there's going to be some opportunities of live football on some pl- social platforms. Mm-hmm. At least I, you know that's a conversation. Uh, I would think so. Yep. I'd be curious to see like how that might net out um, as far as just like live sports across social platforms as a whole. Um, we've obviously seen some OTT products kind of go all in on certain sports and there's to a lot of success. So I'll be curious to kind of just see in the industry as a whole, like where live sports in that social intersection really goes next. Um, and then also, I think I'll be really curious to see like with, with that in mind, where um, fans are going to be able to kind of create or uh their own voice with broadcasts. I think there's a real opportunity, whether it's Twitch or another platform, where people can kind of make a name for themselves using live footage, whether it's basketball, football, or whatever it is, and creating their own audience hmm. uh, with their own personalities using footage, or using games as um, the medium. So I'll be curious to kind of see where that nets out, how that nets out, and so forth. I think we've seen like the Bob Menneries of the world kind of yeah. do their version of it on Instagram. Um, but I think that like personality driven content, leveraging live sports, uh, is interesting. And well, I'll be curious. Let me ask a question that. on that. Cause I mean, it's always, we've never, you know, fair use and parody law. And it's, it's always this kind of gray cloud of the wow, wow West of social still in a way. But you mentioned, um, you know, like that example, right? Like when it comes to highlights, I'm sure technically the NFL could go down on Bob for his his funny commentary, but it, it also extends the brand of the the NFL and it's funny and the fans seem to enjoy it. Like how I guess what is the what is the line? Like how how does that police um, from your standpoint? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, and honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> um, because, yeah, uh, I don't know the rules of fair use. I went to law school, but I'm clearly not a lawyer, um, so I couldn't tell you much about that. I, uh, I'm just kind of focused on the job that, that we do at hand mm-hmm. and, uh, however that type of stuff nets out, so be it. Um, but I do think the right partnership with certain platforms with the right usage could lead to even more consumption down more the line. So, yeah, more exposure. And, uh, I just don't know what that means. Like, I, I think, uh, you know, a lot more, we'll, we'll, we'll learn a lot more in the next couple of years as far as what that can mean. Yeah. That's interesting though. I really like your take on that. Like for instance, if you and I had a Twitch channel, and every Ravens game, you and I commentated on it while it was in the background. Like we saw that with Barstool and those diehard Yankee fans watching that Astro series, and that kind of went viral. But people seem to enjoy that that type of Twitch style commentary from diehard yeah, fans. Yeah, I'll be. Uh, and again, I don't know if like if if, if the NFL is the right platform, or the right sport for mm-hmm. it. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. I, I don't know. But I'll be curious to see if uh, you know where where new developments come from that moving forward. You know, you and I talked about we had lunch a couple of weeks ago and. Even at the team level, like you and I agreed that you're always going to get more distribution from the athletes on your roster than the the mothership handle. And you guys have really doubled down, sending crews out to OBJ and Juju working out in the offseason or what have you. And that's been a, yeah. a big, I guess, talk me through um, how, I talked to Josh about a year ago on this, but I'm sure it's, it's even stronger this season, how you guys are utilizing the actual players to extend the overall NFL message. Yeah, I mean, we... Uh we really kind of think of everything, not just from a league perspective, like from like the league channel perspective, let's say, but we call like the NFL ecosystem as a whole. And so sure, like, you know, we have 50, 60 million followers across league channels, which is great. I mean, like, I think a lot of brands would love to have that type of audience. And we're very fortunate about that. But when you add all 32 clubs followings, you know, you get a few hundred more followers. And, and then when you add all, you know, 1200 plus players, yeah. now you're approaching a uh, close to a billion followers, mm-hmm. like a billion audience. So it's really kind of thinking about how we can leverage and take advantage of the entire ecosystem to get messaging across as many eyes as possible. Add in legends, add in influencers who make sense, mm-hmm. add in partners like Madden or Procter & Gamble or Gatorade yeah. or whatever it might be. Yeah. And really kind of just make sure that we're doing our best to tap into all those different tentacles of the ecosystem to get messaging across and to just make our megaphone as large as possible. In the last five years of the NFL, is there a favorite campaign or um, a content series that kind of blew you away from a number standpoint or kind of what it generated online from your team? Um, you know, I'd say like, just cause it's a bit more like we, we did what we could to really leverage the full ecosystem for kickoff this past year around, um, I don't know if you remember like the song We Ready, which was like our yeah. rallying cry for, for the league. 
And so sure, we had like a really cool uh, commercial spot that was like, a, you know, we posted on social, but also had a real prominence on, on Linear as well. But we did what we could to create player hype videos to that song that we distributed uh, to, you know, dozens of players awesome. to post on their channels. We created graphics with We Ready branding on it hmm. that we sent to, I want to say 70 plus players. Hmm. Custom graphics that like really kind of just got everyone galvanizing around this rallying cry of We Ready. And then also that all complemented some cool graphics, a hero illustration that we created, as well as um, just using that song over more uh, custom videos that we created for the NFL channels. We got colleges involved. Hmm. College is another big part of our, of our ecosystem. Um, and so really this like the more we can create unique assets that are on brand and fit the flavor of different components of the ecosystem, whether it be players, colleges, legends, and so forth, like that's what my team's tasked to do for Smart. a large part is to create that content, then distribute across the tentacles to get the proper messaging a a across. And so I think that's that was really successful for us, but I think that just that's really just the tip of the spear. I think there's really so the tip of the iceberg, I should say. There's so much more we can be doing and and following that type of template to really kind of maximize the the reach of anything that we do. That's so smart. I because I, I really think in our industry, Dave, like there's not a not a lot of people think about their entire what you call ecosystem. Like even at you know Disney Plus did a really good job recently where they had. Pixar and they had Nat Geo and everybody in the Disney family, ESPN, like they had a big tweet thread of all those different people kind of speaking out about Disney Plus. You know, NBC's done something similar with NBC and NBC Sports and USA Network and things like that, but not often do people understand, hey, we have this entire ecosystem. <laughs> Let's find a way to create unique content. I guess from an athlete standpoint, I'm assuming the response has been overwhelmingly positive when you're sending those guys content um, that's unique to them. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, like we, and like this again, this is a top-down mm -hmm. philosophy, and so it's a really a lot of credit goes to to Tim Ellis and to Ian Trombetta, like our CMO or SVP, like my boss. But like, we're not going to just send them cookie cutter content yeah. that you know it's a template that we're just you know changing logos know. or like yeah. we're doing what we can to create stuff in their personality, like that that when when we're creating a George Kittle video that mm -hmm. that like. You know, we're hoping that if he wants to post, he can post. Or that the Niners want to post, they can post. Like, it feels like something that they would post or yeah. that he would post. So it's authentic and organic for them. And so uh, we really do what we can to to kind of just study our players, to, to kind of get a better sense of like some of their their interests and their fashion sense or whatever it might be, and create content that, that they would be proud to be to, to be using. You know, you and I talked about this a little bit uh, a few weeks ago as well. But you know, with a large team. NFL 365, you know, it's it's hard to uh, take a couple days off with all the craziness and all the headlines, especially going into the playoffs and the Super Bowls coming up. Um, from a, a team and culture standpoint, is there anything as a leader that you've learned that you implement? Uh, just kind of, I guess, your core belief on how to keep the team motivated, especially through the season. Oh man, um, like I think there's a few things there. Like the, our season is long, but it's not that long, mm -hmm. like compared to to other leagues. So I think. There's like probably just like an understanding that, you know, we got to, you know, strap up our bootstraps for like a good four, four month period. Mm -hmm. But it's not every day is going to be like this. You know, there, there is some sense of an off season, although uh, it's become <laughs> diminished uh, yeah. every year. But like I do what I can to to really kind of one create capacity so that it's not always the same people having to work the same shifts mm -hmm. at all times. So I think that's the first thing where it's like like the more bodies that we have that can help each other out, like they're, they're, there's less of a need for the same people having to work crazy hours. With that said, there still are people who work crazy hours, crazy hours yeah. and that's just the reality of, of working in the industry that we are. Mm -hmm. But I also make it a point where people wanna work from home certain times, like I'm more than amenable to that, um, just given how easy it is to work, um, whether it's through Slack and communicate through Slack or whatever, text messaging, whatever it might be, like, if that makes it so that someone can go home for Thanksgiving or for Christmas or just for whatever reason they might want, like I'm more than open to that type of stuff. And I think it's just like so important for people to have balance in their life because like it's just not sustainable otherwise. Yeah. Like you want people, I want, when we're hiring people, I want people here for, for three, five, mm -hmm. seven, ten years and not to just come here for a year and a burn half out, yeah. out, and then go on to the next thing. So I really do what I can to, to kind of foster that type of culture and uh, it's important, it, it, it's essential. Super Bowl is in Miami, which is super exciting. Should be fun. Um, 
How far out do you guys start planning that? You know, and from an NFL perspective, it's obviously regardless of the teams, you guys are going to show up and and do some fun stuff. Um, how do you approach what is the biggest event in the world on a yearly basis? Yeah, um, I'd say we start planning for Super Bowl. Man, the, the uh, day after the start, last Super Bowl. <laughs> I mean, like to, to a certain extent, yeah. yes, but like to a large extent, like we're still figuring stuff out right now. Yeah. So, like, I think high level, you start thinking things several months in advance but now we're kind of like now i'm in the thick of it mm -hmm. like i'm working day to day with our brand team to better understanding of like some of the messaging that we're going across i'm having regular conversations with our platform partners to kind of see what kind of presence they might want to have in miami mm -hmm. whether it's uh at nfl honors which is like where the mvps announced That's in right, rookie yeah. of the year and so forth the night before or at radio row or on the red carpet mm -hmm. or whatever it might be um like the Super Bowl is the the biggest show in town, and uh, it's like imperative that we we put a lot of thought behind it. So I'd be you know we think about it a lot. That's awesome. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I know we're kind of short on time, so I do want to get into some rapid fire questions here towards the end. Um, all right, so what is the one social or marketing tool that you cannot live without? Oh man, <laughs> um, I'd say. I would say it's like purely for a news perspective. So I like always can stay on top of what's happening. Like I, I check Twitter an absurd yeah. amount of time. Absurd. Twitter, my, my, my tweet deck or my Twitter stream is always on. On a daily basis, over under 50 times that you check it. Over. <laughs> yeah. Over. Taking it over. Um, from a business perspective for the at NFL, what social platforms, let me put it to you this way. What social platforms are getting the best organic reach for you right now? All of them. <laughs> there you go. All right, uh, keep it keep it classy. I like it. Um, all right, so I will say in an industry that moves so fast, like the one we're in, um, anything outside of just checking Twitter and following the right accounts that you read that you're talking to, like how do you stay on the cutting edge and make sure you guys are innovating in terms of all the different platform updates and things like that that are happening? Honestly, I think internally Slack has become awesome for us. Mm -hmm. We're like I become aware of certain things that I otherwise would not just because. We have super vibrant Slack channels where my entire team's on, or other people within this, the NFL media building is. They're like, hey, like check out this article, or look at what Overtime's doing over here, yeah. or check out the TikTok account, mm -hmm. and so forth. So like that type of word of mouth, um, and just like those one-off um, components, like add up and make such an impact that that's huge for me. Like from a discoverability stand, stand like standpoint, like it's in, it's become huge because otherwise, like I'm just following the same accounts I always follow. Yeah, you're and just the same. Like uh, echo chamber, otherwise, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, you're the one. Like instead of just having, you only have so much time in the day. But if everybody can do their part on saying, "Hey, I saw this," or yeah. "Look at this update," I like that. Our NFL Slack channels are are bumping. Like there's a lot <laughs> on there. There's a lot. Of we in our on. Slack channel, we have like random crazy ideas, like you know whatever. All these different sub channels are pretty funny. Um, what's the one thing you wish you could do more of at the NFL? Oh man, um, I wish we could do like more activations as a whole hmm. like i think just like we had some fun in jacksonville like a few weeks ago with like minch mania or even last year we like went to new orleans for to celebrate drew Brees is breaking um uh like the, the the yardage record yeah. i think like knowing how impactful some like actual real life uh activations can be hmm. i think like there's a lot more we can do there to create like a, a physical presence hmm. and physical new or like original content that I wish I had the bandwidth to like be everywhere and create yeah. like a college game day atmosphere every week where like we're going mm. to this city or maybe we're even going to this high school or whatever it might be mm. and, and create content around there. And so I'm hopeful we can do some more of that moving forward. But like from a bandwidth capacity, like I would love to do a lot more like real unique original content along those lines. And what's a two, true ROI there? Is it to just get more content, like fan facing activations to get more distribution about these different temples? For you guys yeah i mean i think it's a few things yeah. one is like i think one it's like okay we have an opportunity to have like a footprint in a city where we otherwise might not hmm. so like to actually like draw awareness and to have presence there two it's like there's gonna and because of that there's gonna be some like word of mouth and and just like you know marketing along those lines right. to kind of get our out there especially something like the check down where we're like you know people are not familiar with it yep um, and then also it's like, it's, it's an opportunity to kind of own something and create real original content. Mm -hmm. Like I think sure, like literally NFL highlights are original content for us. Like that's proprietary right. to us, but I think fans are so used to it that like, it doesn't seem like 
oh, like that's the NFL. Like they can like a, a lot of other publications are using that content, whether we want them to or not. Right. I mean, that's just that's just like, it's not fair. Whether they might be just getting it on Sports Center or wherever yeah. they might be getting it. Yeah. But like to create unique events where we can tie our brand, whether it's the NFL or the Checkdown to, or one of our clubs to, whatever it might be, because that's a win for us as well. Like I think that's where it's like, oh, like they did this. That's the original content because of them, and and that's. That's uh, good stuff right there. I love it. I totally agree. Um, what inspires you? You've done it for five years now, and you've gone through the the grind of uh, the, the NFL season. This will be your fifth year, it sounds like. But um, what gets you up in the morning? What excites you these days? Oh man, um, oh, man. My honestly, my team inspires me. Like yeah. I'm, I'm old already. I'm in like my <laughs> mid thirties. Like I, to be able to like walk. We have an awesome room. I don't know. Next time you're in LA, you yeah, have yeah. to walk you around. But like I have a. A room for the lab as a whole and it's like a it's a good size room where there's tvs like uh around you know every wall there's probably like 20 30 tvs in there and it's just like there it's fully open so like you know there's no walls like it's just like an open space and the amount of creativity vibe, and just yeah. like fun conversations that happen in there are great mm -hmm. like and, and that's like it's inspiring to be around such like an amazing young team that always wants to do more always has a million ideas always wants to you know, take a good idea and accelerate it to 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 a great idea and even better idea and so forth. So like, that's inspiring to me. And like, I I do what I can to just get out of their way. Yeah. And and give them to break down the right walls so that those ideas can come to life. And to to fight for some ideas that might seem a little more off the wall, mm -hmm. but to actually like, you know, from a bureaucratic standpoint, like make the right phone calls or the right meetings to to make them come to life. And so that's that's been super. It sounds like the me. check down's a perfect example of that, right? It's like well. For sure. Sounds like it's a good idea. Let me make some phone calls, see if we can get this thing launched. Um, what do you have a guilty social follow? Oh man, <laughs> getting real deep on you. Now. I uh, I have like a. I would say at this point, my wife would definitely agree that I have like an unhealthy sneaker um, yeah, obsession. Me too. Point. And you know what, Instagram. I've said this before. The Instagram shopping is really hurting my. Uh, my wallet, because now it's so yeah. easy to buy these new Jordans and stuff no, like no, that. And I would actually say <laughs> shopping as a whole is another like innovation that the next like few years of like how that can oh, go sure. even more and take off even more. Yeah. So I would I would put that uh, on the list as well. But yeah, I follow way too many sneaker accounts. <laughs> I buy way too many sneakers. So are you a StockX guy? Are you a Goat guy? I mean, do you? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> it's like all, all of them. just take all my money. It's just and then it's Nike not. too. Nike on Instagram is just like putting those you know colorways of Jordan in front of me. Ugh. Exactly, man. It's a it's a real issue. Yeah, it's a, it's a real issue. I agree. Um, one of my last questions for you, like any I guess any advice for your your fellow social media uh, folks out there. Um, you've obviously done some great job in your career thus far. VP at a at a such a large brand like the NFL, but what's um what's the advice you like to give to to people coming up? Um, man, for people coming up, like like new people like joining the industry and so forth. Yeah, people that strive to kind of be in your position. Oh man, like I I would say this whether it's like in this industry or mm -hmm. anywhere, like I think it's just so important to like show like work ethic and that you care. Yeah. Like that is talent's important and like it's not easy to find talent, but talent's only so valuable when it's matched with like the dedication and the work ethic of desire. And like, I remember like when I was starting at MLB, like I would work whatever hours they wanted me. Like mm -hmm. Friday night, I had to work, cover the Dodgers Padres game that went into extra innings. And I was living in New York at the time. So I had to stay up till 3 AM and lost my weekend for it. Like whatever. Yeah. Like I, I, I like just wanted to get into my foot in the door. And once it was there, I had to like, just, I was obsessed with like proving that like you, you could not get rid of me. Like you'd be an idiot to like mm -hmm. not to, to, to like take, to continue your organization without me being a part of it. Yep. And so I, I really just think like that's so important to just to just kind of just show how much you you especially in the early early stages is like how much you care yep. and uh, your desire as a whole. And so like I think work ethic is super important. Um, and I'd also just say as a whole like. Social is such a weird place where like the rules constantly change mm -hmm. and what truth what, what might be true one day is no longer true the next day. Like I think approaching things and I think I'm lucky where I just like it's kind of how I view life as a whole, but like I don't pretend like I know anything. Like like I, I don't pretend to have preconceived notions of like what works and what's not gonna work. Like sure, obviously there's like nuance and like you start forming a like well rounded opinions as, you know, things mature and so forth, but like you have to be so open-minded yeah. and so open to new ideas and new perspectives that 
if you're not, like you're going to be left behind. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say like be as open-minded and pretend like you don't know anything as much as possible and, and typically good things will happen. Um, I've already, um, I think, oh no, my last question for you is, um, yeah, if you could recommend anybody in your network that you think would provide value or be a good guest on the pod uh, here coming up, anybody that comes to mind for you that would be uh, good to chat with? Oh yeah, I mean, I have <laughs> oh, yeah. dozens of people on my team who would be, who are way more, way smarter, more creative than <laughs> I. So, uh, I have no shortage of, of people, but I don't know, there's so many, I mean, like there's so much talent out there. Mm. Like, I feel like when I, join social like when I, when I decided to like do this like I was like eh, do I want to be the Twitter guy for MLB like I, I didn't yeah. like I didn't put, like a stigma to it almost so, like yeah. and like people like my my in-laws asking like like what are you doing like what's going on my own parent like now it's just like there's every single brand every single college every single college team every like what like there's so much out there like Dude, like the the world's your oyster, David Brickley. Like, yeah, go, hey, go. appreciate it, man. They're, they're out there. Yeah, um, the uh, Michael Bucklin, who was on the show right before you, I'm sure you've dealt with him, Fox Sports, the NFL guy. But he said, historically, we're going to be correct when it comes to this whole digital and social thing. Some people still feel like it's not, to your point, you know, back in the day, it's like, what is this Twitter thing? But now it's like, yeah. oh, this is big business, everybody. So listen up. Sure. Um, well, David, thank you so much for the time, man. I'm looking forward to, to seeing you soon. And thanks for dropping the knowledge on the fine folks. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me and uh, hope to chat soon, man. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Take care. Right Bye. There he is, David Feldman. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the program, man. I really appreciate that. That was some, some really amazing stuff as always. Man, I mean, I always say that and it sounds cliche. Well, amazing stuff. But like every single episode, we... Uh, you know, these these gals and guys are dropping knowledge, man. I think it's, a, I don't know, it's just a valuable valuable program to listen to, in my opinion, because I personally, it's a selfish endeavor for me. I learn something new every day. And I think, you know, even what he did uh, in the beginning of the season too, Will, uh, for the Get Ready campaign, just brilliant. It's like, why not use what he called it? And I haven't really heard anybody say it that way before, and uh, maybe it's just me, but I like what, how he put it, the ecosystem, right? You have the NFL, you have the players, you have colleges, potentially, you have the NFL legends. There's so many people in that ecosystem, and all it takes is to ask or, you know, go out there and produce some unique content. And then, you know, OBJ, Juju, these guys have a certain type of um, um, audience. And if you're able to create unique content that speaks well to that audience, then I think you'll be in good shape. All right. Um, that was episode 49. Uh, as always, I want to thank David Furker. Wait, oh, sorry, Zoe just played, uh, pressed play on something. Uh, David Furker, uh, I want to thank uh, Will Kelly, of course. Was Dylan, Dylan in the house on this one? Or are we, uh, we, we're we not thanking Dylan? Extra credit. We're not thanking Dylan, extra credit for Dylan. Uh, um, all right, so we appreciate everybody joining. Uh, make sure to go on iTunes. We really appreciate if you guys um, can rate us five stars on iTunes if you're enjoying the program, if you're getting value out of it. That means a lot to us and the show. Uh, we will be back for episode 50. Well, we made it. 50 episodes of the Business Social Podcast. We're looking forward to it. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll uh, see you guys for episode 50.